welcome everyone. Welcome to our Meet Your She Hero event with retired fire captain Cindy Schoonerball. We're really excited about this program today. I also have an announcement to make, which is a lot of fun. Uh, several weeks ago, a publisher approached me about a book called Sister in a Brotherhood. I guess you can't really see it, but Sister in a Brotherhood <laughs> Stories from My Life as a Female Firefighter. And it was written by Cindy Schooner Ball. So I looked at it and I thought, you know, this sounds really interesting. And they sent me the book and I read it and I literally could not put it down. It was so well written. It was so juicy and personal, but it was so full of fascinating information about firefighting that I shared it with the board. And I said, let's make Cindy our next Meet Your She Hero because boy, boy, does she have some stories to tell. So <laughs> as we announced our our meet your she hero event we also started brainstorming and we have now created the she heroes book club and we're really excited about this you can find it on our website you know sheheroes.org slash book club we have six selections up there now and we encourage all of you to check check out our book club. We'll be sending out notices. We'll be posting book lists. We'll be doing things. Uh, we'll be listing books, for example, for Black History Month or National Women's Month. And, and always trying to keep uh, current with our book club and our selections. But we, we would also like to really encourage you to contact me, Lori, L-O-R-I, at sheheroes.org because we'd love to know what recommendations you have for books. And what we're talking about are books for, you know, read aloud books for young young kids and books for girls, tweens, teens, and women of all kinds. So, you know, we're really excited to launch the book club. We hope that you guys will all enjoy it and we welcome you to check it out. So before I turn everything over to Cindy, first, we will have a few words from our co-founder of She Heroes, Dr. Sophia Yen. Sophia, how are you? <laughs> hey, hey. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm here to talk about um, She Heroes, and we founded She Heroes with with three MIT alumni, um, myself and two others. Um, one is a fellow sorority sister, Alpha Chi Omega, and the other was just another alumna, so all three women MIT alumni. And the idea was to provide free online videos targeting third graders and up before they trim their tree of possibilities. So when you ask young people, what do you wanna be when you grow up? We wanna make sure they have all the options out there. And there's certainly programming for high school students and college students, but we found that we wanted to catch them before they trim that tree down. Because by the time they hit high school, they had already trimmed that tree. And so when you Google um, physicists, we want you to find somebody excited talking about why they did that job, what obstacles they've overcome, and how you too can become that as well. And She Heroes can serve both um, all genders because um, certainly we want those um, boys to be able to realize that they will have women CEOs, they will have women um, chief firefighters, they will have women uh, senators, women presidents, hopefully someday. So um, that is the purpose of She Heroes, to show that those of us with uteri can be whatever we want to be, um, or born with uteri, um, when we grow up someday, as long as we work hard towards it. Great. Well, thank you so much for that, Sophia. And I should also mention, we not only started our new book club, but we made Sister in a Brotherhood our very first book club selection. So we encourage you all to read it. You will love Cindy's stories. They're just so, they're so wonderful. So on that note, I would like to introduce our, our retired firefighter and fire captain, Cindy Schooner Ball. How are you, Cindy? I am great, Lori. Uh, thank you so much for uh, contacting me and, and asking me to get involved in this really wonderful organization. Uh, my hat's off to you as well as Sophia and all the other uh, women on your team. Well, great. It's wonderful to meet you. And 
the way that we usually like to do things here is we like to start at the beginning and then work our way through. <laughs> so, okay. So you, by, you, by your own description in your book, say that you have had an improbable journey. So let's get all the way back to the basics. I know you had a lot of challenges growing up. We love to hear how, yeah. you know, kids overcome the challenges that surround them and and find their mm -hmm. way into their careers. So let's start out about that. What were you like as a little kid? You know, I was the baby. Uh, my oldest sister was 16 years older. My parents were depression parents. Uh, my father was born in 1917 and he was the last of 19 kids. My mother was, uh, yeah, my dad would say on a good day, he had a large sandwich to go to school. My mother was uh, of five children, and her mother died when she was seven. Her father was a preacher uh, in Kentucky on horseback, and uh, she uh, she just wanted to be a mother, and she was wonderful. She left uh, Kentucky to go live with her older sister in Ohio when she was 16 years old, met my father, and had my sister when she was 17. So uh, I come from a family of, uh, you know, two, another sister that's 11 years older and she raised me. And then I had a, a brother who was six and a half years older. So I was, um, I was, I was the baby. And really it was kind of funny because I felt almost like an only child because literally I became an aunt. I was nine years old. Mm -hmm. My sisters had moved out and uh, started their own family. And you know, I loved, uh, I, we were poor. And I say that in my book, you know, we were really poor, uh, had no inside bathroom, very difficult for a six-year-old girl. Mm -hmm. uh, my heritage is native American Indian, which was looked down upon. And, you know, I was ashamed of it. I say in my book, uh, as kids bullied me or a little bit, they, they called my brother who was six foot eight squaw man and me Pocahontas. And so, you know, books became uh, my imaginary carpet ride to any kind of um, life and experience that I thought I wanted to have. I started reading really at four years old and I love to read and I love music. So those were my passions. And I was involved in both at from a very young age. Uh, my father was a brick mason. And my sister that ended up raising me, she married a native Floridian and he was from Cocoa, Florida, had restaurants. His mother had restaurants. He worked at the Space Center. He was an electrician. And so uh, we would go down, you know, it gets really cold in Ohio in the winter and you can't lay bricks. And my father would load us up in the car and take us to Florida. And, and I fell in love with Florida from the very first moment I set eyes on it. It just, I fell in love with it. And I always say, we actually lived in a trailer that had a bathroom. So I was very happy, <laughs> an inside bathroom. But then we would go back and forth and I would cry. I would write my sister these desperate letters and poems, how I just hated it. I'd go back to Ohio. So from the ages of about nine to nine till I was 13, we'd go back and forth. My sister at 13, her and her husband, she was 24 and she became my legal. They became my legal guardians wow. so I could stay. Well, and that teaches you a lot of resilience when you're moving around like that. There's nothing more scary than that first day at a new school in the lunchroom. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I, uh, but I embraced it. You know, I embraced Florida in such a, in such a way that it really wasn't scary for me. It, it was heartbreaking for me when it was time to pack up and go back. So, um, so I, I spent, uh, uh, my early, I guess, tween years in Cocoa, Florida. And then I, uh, met my, I met my boyfriend. I was a bank teller in high school school and uh my brother-in-law made me work at the restaurant one night a week if I wanted a car <laughs> and I actually moved out and on my own at 16 years old and uh worked as a bank teller and I met my, my boyf boyfriend and I started living with my boyfriend at the age of 17 and uh he and a couple of buddies uh we ended up moving around to Tampa and then we moved to Fort Lauderdale in 1977 and I had jobs I I, I worked any kind of job to keep a roof over my head, uh, everything from waiting tables to secretarial work. Uh, I modeled in my 20s in South Florida, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm, Miami area. 
And I would say I was a secretary model, waitress model, whatever, but none of them fulfilled me. Mm. Uh, so, I put so my you, boy through. So you weren't too focused on a career necessarily. I mean, you were having to scramble to make a living and make ends meet and, and all of those things. I did. Mm-hmm keep keep a roof over our head i mean he he landscaped and then uh i put him through fire school and uh he was a forest ranger and a buddy of his said you need to go to fire school so i helped by waiting tables at that point in time you know we were young didn't have any money and put him through fire school um and i just you know i was unfulfilled as the years went by you know i got older and i didn't i didn't feel fulfilled at the jobs that i was working and i just really didn't know what i was going to do um, you know, it's one thing to, you know, you have to work to keep food on the table, but, you know, to have something that fulfills you, uh, your passion. And, and I just didn't find it until, um, you know, I, when I put him through fire school, he got hired by a small department, uh, um, in Broward County, but a small department. And I, I go and have dinner at the fire station. Like most young girls do, you know, their wives, girlfriends, whatever they you come to the fire station. You just want to look cute and sit at the table and have dinner with your boyfriend. And in the meantime, um, I grew to love running. I started running and working out very, uh, hard when I was 22. I started jumping rope and running and, and I, and I found that was a wonderful outlet for me. So, uh, I did, started doing that. So I was really fit. I would do all the races, 10 K's and things like that around town. And anyway, I was getting toward uh, my mid twenties, and you know, I sat at the table with the, and said, you know, I telling the chief and talking about how I just I don't know I'm bored I I don't know what I'm going to do I'm I'm a secretary it's just not fulfilling for me, and the chief looked at me and he said, um, why don't you become a firefighter? You should become a firefighter. It's an up and coming you know uh, profession for women. And uh, I looked at him and said, you're not you're crazy. I had no intention of becoming a firefighter. I just wanted to look cute for my boyfriend. So I looked down the table because I'm, I'm waiting to hear him snicker and laugh and, you know, say, yeah, right. And they didn't. None of the guys did. They looked at me and they said, oh, yeah, we'll help you. We'll help you get in the fire academy. You can come here. We'll teach you how to roll a hose properly, how to, you know, uh, how to raise a ladder properly. We'll We'll help you do all that stuff and it'll give you a head start. You know, you're in shape. You're in better shape than we are. And I said, uh, ah, thanks. No, thanks. Well, now let's, <laughs> uh, let's just also interject at this at this point, though. This was several decades ago at a time when there were, what, no women in the firefighting field? No, I think it was, well, there was, a, it was 1% nationally, I think, at that time, probably. Yeah. There were a couple. Sure, there were women that came before me, but this is this is the mid-80s you know, uh, at that point, you know, probably 84, 85. And so, um, I always say as the wheels of fate, you know, happen, you know, I was falling out of love. I wasn't in love with my boyfriend anymore. I've been with him. We were together 12 years. I wasn't that 17 year old impressionable young girl anymore. I was, uh, in my, uh, you know, mid to later twenties mm. at that point. And so, uh, we ended up breaking up and, uh, as I say, I did a quick, you read the book, I did a quick stint in Texas and hated it and came back and um, was a secretary. And in the meantime, my mother had given me an, a letter that I kept hidden in a, in a, I just threw it in my drawer, sock drawer. And um, he said, you might need this letter one day. And I said, probably not. And what it was is my great grandfather was a full blood of Mohawk Indian. And he had grown up, he'd been born on the banks of the Sandusky River. His parents, his dot, his mother had died uh, in the 1800 cholera epidemic. And his father told him that. And he couldn't read or write. But he had to uh, go before a judge and state that, have his ex uh, pretty much signed by the judge that it was authentic. And my mother had the letter. And she gave it to me. And I said, uh, yeah, you know, thanks. So... When I decided I needed to do something, uh, I actually got got fired a week before I was going to get a week vacation as a secretary because I didn't want to work weekends for nothing and be the first one there in the you know morning and la last one there at night. I ended up going to the unemployment office. Uh, I had been raised to get a job. I had been raised to you you get a job, and that's you know I don't care what it is. You don't take a handout. But I was desperate, 
So I find myself and I'm standing in line waiting to fill out the paperwork. And I see this sign on the uh, cork board and it says, if you're an American uh, native, Native American, call this number. And I kind of looked at it funny and I thought, oh man, what I had to lose. I got, the, I called the number and it was the Seminole Indian Reservation uh, yeah, organization. And so took the letter, met with the counselor. She wasn't of Indian descent, but I said, I want to go to the fire academy and be a firefighter. You about fell off her chair and said, really? And I said, yes, but it costs a hundred dollars and I don't have a hundred dollars. I, I don't have, you know, I'm broke. And she said, well, she showed me the letter and they ended up providing me the financial ability to uh, get that hundred dollars. And, and I started the fire academy because in the state of Florida, uh, you have to go to a fire academy and then you pass all these tests after all this training and you get your state of Florida certification that allows you to then start testing with different fire departments. Mm. And so that's, that's what I did. I signed up. Well, how, how important is your Native American heritage to you? Do you have, have you got like a whole extended family somewhere or? Well, you know, it's something that uh, a lot, a lot of the people um, I have uh, who I've never met, you know, I have a cousin that, that actually uh, was out West and, and, and taught for a while. And he was a guide in Alaska and I had a couple other people, but but to be frankly, Frank, uh, not really. I don't. I don't have that connection with with people. I tried to do a lot of research on my uh, heritage, and you know, a lot of that is very complicated. I have found out there are people that know about it. It was almost like a secretive thing, and it was kind of weird to me. But um, but uh, nonetheless, the Seminole Indians, I'll always be uh, eternally grateful to them, and and hope to possibly uh, do some speaking at their down in their organization for young girls well um, okay so we don't know we, now, no, all right we are now launching you into your firefighting <laughs> career and uh, <laughs> one of the things that blew me away was the <laughs> rigors of the training that you had to do maybe you can kind of walk us through what happens when you decide to become a firefighter what happens next <laughs> well when you when you go to the fire academy you know, it's, 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 it's like a, it's a paramilitary, the fire department, it serves as a paramilitary organization. So it's very structured and, you know, they start off, luckily, you know, you start off running push-ups, climbing stairs, uh, picking up uh, rolls of hose, which are usually in 50 foot sections and they weigh quite a bit and you start doing all these physical things. They teach you how to properly, you know, you have to raise a 24 foot ladder by yourself, tie it off. Then you start dragging dummies out of burn buildings. You learn all the aspects of fire, uh, different types, uh, different ways to put it out. So that's all this basic stuff. And at that time, um, you learned uh, basic, you know, bandaging, bandaging, basic medical care. There was an, you weren't an EMT at that point. It was all separate. Uh, so after doing that, you get tested. Uh, you get tested on everything. And if you pass that, uh, we had a state Florida fire instructor uh, come down and he tested us at the end of our training in the academy. And I passed. So then oh, that wait, allowed uh, me. Okay, hang on. Uh, Let me ask you a question. How many pounds uh, did you have to haul? You have to, well, your gear alone weighs uh, with an air pack is 75 pounds. Oh my God. So you have to be able to drag uh, 150 pounds. But uh, I always say, as firefighters, we're a crew. We go in together on situations and we leave together. But yes, you have to be able to drag. You have to be able to pull uh, all kinds of testing with hose. You have to be able to, you know, you had to run with it. And and uh, you had to be able to drag a dummy, a 150-pound dummy, wow. uh, 100 feet. You know, you had, and it's all timed. So you have to really just, you know, be on the ball. You had to do so many push-ups, sit-ups. You had to raise a ladder and have it at proper climbing angle. Uh, you had to do all kinds of things. And that was in the fire academy, which I thought was rigorous. Thank God I was in shape and I worked out. The running used to kill ha half the people. And I was like, hey, this is great. But I would take my bunker gear, which is your fire gear. I would take it home and I'd run around the neighborhood. I'd run around the park with my stuff on in Florida. Wow. I, I get on the treadmill with it, you know, and, and, you know, you just do those things to, to 
to get your endurance to where it should be. So you didn't you didn't find the uh, the physical challenges to be too intimidating. You you rose to the they challenge. weren't intimidating. Um, I I welcomed them. I mean, I said I I felt like the first day I when I started the fire academy itself, I never looked back. I never looked back. And not to say you know everybody has a down day and they try. That's what they try to do to you. They try to break you down so that you form a group, and that's how they do it. They they, they you know. Push, push, push. But I had I had a retired, uh, I had a firefighter that worked for Palm Beach County. He was an instructor and he was uh, from Boston. And I say that in the book. He, he had these blue eyes, just crystal blue eyes, piercing. And he was tough. And he wore his hat, his helmet, not his hat, his helmet cocked on his head. And he's like, you know, put some ass into it, Broward. That's what you call him. Put, put some ass into it. You're a woman. Your legs are the strongest. Come on now, because you'd have to raise, uh, raise a, a ladder, you know, ladder up, and then you know tie it off properly. And uh, he never, he had more faith in me, and so he taught me a lot to about you know techniques and things. You learn all that, but then once that's done, in those days, you have to apply to every separate fire department. There was no, G, there was no you know social media nothing like that you had to act physically there was a board in the fire academy that had little signs that said you know this department's hiring this department will be testing this department will be testing so individually you had to call and get on a list and take tests for those individual departments which in, which was a written test an oral exam and a physical agility test you got scored you were put on a list that lasted six months and as the hiring process went that's how you, that's how, that's how I got hired. It took me a year and I got hired by Broward County. And that County. was after you got out of the fire academy, I guess. Oh, and yes. So yes. Cool. Yeah. It was a year later. I, I know, tested for a year. Yeah. Oh, let's talk about credentials because I know back in the day you only, you were doing bandages, but um, today you need to be what? An EMT and a paramedic. And you have to be a paramedic. Uh, you have to be a paramedic. Okay, so a paramedic is is higher uh, a higher medical skill than than an EMT. Um, when I got hired, right after I got hired and was on shift, I had signed up with the same academy that had a separate separate classroom for EMT, and I was going to EMT school, and that was considered the golden goose back in the eighties. If you were a firefighter EMT, it was golden, because in my department, Broward Fire and Broward EMS were separate. Mm. Um, but I mean, to be an EMT was great. So I, I became an EMT shortly after. But what, what is the difference between an EMT and a paramedic? An EMT, it, it varies uh, from state to state, but in the state of Florida, you cannot start IVs. You can, uh, you can do uh, EKGs, you can uh, you know, put an oxygen mask on somebody, you know, that, that sort of thing. Take vitals, uh, blood pressures, pulse ox, uh, glucose checks. That sort of thing. You can do some bandaging, but as a paramedic, you innovate people. You know, if you had to, if you had to uh, decompress their chest, there you had to, you could do that. We gave multiple medications. We were very, very assertive and aggressive in Broward to, to begin with. Um, you know, so it was all part of, um, you know, you, all part of a paramedic is just it's an emergent it's emergency medicine. We innovated a lot of people. Um, you know, obviously, you know, CPR and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, you start IVs, stick tube down people's throat. You can, you know, uh, do all kinds of invasive procedures that uh, going to paramedic school is not for sissies either. But that came 15 years later when we merged. Well, uh, yeah, well yeah. And, and and this is just an aside, but I find it a very curious fact. In your book, you mentioned the, the, the fact that there's always two fire trucks showing up for a medical emergency, for example. There's always like the, the medical ambulance, but then also the fire truck. And I guess yes. we ask you a lot, why do we have to have two? Can you explain what's going on there? Yes, I always say on, uh, we call them ALS engines, which most progressive departments are these days, and it's advanced life support uh, engines. Um, they The only thing you can't do on a fire truck that you can do on a rescue truck is transport people. All the equipment, you have the same stuff because everybody's dual certified. 
Uh, and it also takes a lot of hands, a lot of man, a lot of people power, I should say. Uh, see, it depends on how large the scene is. You might have a an extremely uh, difficult medical call where the patient is um, uh, somewhere very difficult to get out with three people or two people on a rescue truck. Um, also, the officer is recording and everything and 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 uh, orchestrating the call with what needs to be done so that she or he can relay it to the hospital and route. Uh, and and nobody's you know very few people are eighty pounds. You know it's labor intensive. You've got backboard stretcher. Um, O2 uh, med box. Um, you have so many things. It takes a lot of hands, and that's what I used to tell people. You know, it takes a lot of hands, especially if you have a uh, someone in cardiac arrest, or if you have a car accident where there's several patients. It takes a lot of hands, and then you know people don't understand that, and they always say, "Please tell the fire truck not to turn their sirens on." And you're like, "No, you have to. I mean, really, for safety to get there." But but that's that's the main reason. And then a lot of times if the rescue is tied up and they're calling mutual aid rescue, the fire truck's the first one on scene administering care and doing all those things and waiting for the rescue truck so that it could a patient can be transported. So, okay, the fascinating stuff. And then, you know, here you are a woman in what is clearly a male <laughs> world. <laughs> and I, I, we're all just on the edge of our seats. What is it like working with all these men? Do they haze you? Do they harass you? Do they respect you? And you're and you're not only just working with them; you're actually sleeping with them because you're sure, young. sure, yeah. eating, sleeping, all that, that stuff. Goes. <laughs> well, uh, firehouse, your shift is twenty four hours on and forty eight hours off, so you live in the firehouse. So obviously, you you know, you have a bunk room where you sleep and you have, you know, living quarters uh, and the kitchen and all that stuff. Um, it was funny because um, I was one of two women to get hired. And so, you know, the words out, you know, telephone, tell a firefighter and they would, you know, get word from the instructors even who were on shift, you know, how, how are these women doing? And so, you know, we had the other, I say the other woman that got hired with me, she was a triathlete. And she had been a she had been a volunteer firefighter, in Palm Beach County. So I would say she didn't take crap from anybody. And she probably we thought she'd make shit. We, she'd become a chief before any of us did. <laughs> so that was the joke. But we were we were very confident, confident women. And, and a lot of it, I believe, is because we were not 18 years old. Um, I say in my book, I I was um, I was 30 when I got hired and I turned 31 two months later. So I had been around all the sketchiness of men, particularly when I was a model, even when I was a secretary. So I was pretty confident at that point. Uh, you know, the men were the men were really great. Uh, and some of the crustiest old time chiefs, I don't know if they were bemused, but or what they they gave me a chance and they saw how hard I worked out. Uh, I said, you know. I worked, I worked really hard to, and I became a sponge to learn everything. The first guys I worked with, uh, you know, made sure that I was thorough. They had my back. They, my first Lieutenant was, uh, his wife was a paramedic at the time and they were just, you know, they taught me so much. Uh, it was always funny in my book. I talk about the battalion chief. He was my battalion chief and he was one of the instructors that would smoke a cigarette while we would have to, uh, one of our, one of our physical challenges, when I was hired is we had to put, this is after working for hours out in the sun, we would run to the fire academy or the police academy, which was uh, two and a half miles away, full bunker gear, which, and uh, we would do military chants, do all the, do all the, uh, the stuff at the police academy, all the stuff they had set up for, for their recruits. And then when we would run back, well, the first night I was on shift, he gave me his room because they didn't know what to do with women. And, you know, officers have their own room for the most part. And that was a big no-no. Never did that again. He never did that again. He was chastised. She, she's, she's one of us. She sleeps in the same room. So literally the first room I slept in, it was me and two other guys. And we had uh, three twin beds. They were on caster wheels. And they basically, was, you know, the room was eight by 10. So you know how small it was. We get up for calls and you basically bump into each other, you know getting getting dressed to run out to the truck to respond to the call <laughs> and uh hazing uh I talk in my book what they what they did to me they didn't do any of the hazing that that 
you know, harmful things. Um, two of the guys decided that they were going to take the caster wheels off my bed. They replaced it with pencils and they put um, aerosol spray cans underneath the bed so that when I plopped down on it, the pencils would break and the aerosol cans would, would, would go off. Well, I was so light. I got on my bed. I had a great night's sleep. The pencils never broke. And I woke up the next morning with both of them looking at me like, man, he's like the princess in the pea. I swear. <laughs> that is so funny. So you passed the test, right? <laughs> I passed the test. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we, there were other things, you know, we used to have to fold the flag uh, or unfold the flag and, and raise it at sunrise and take it down at sunset, do this whole big uh, ceremony. And some of the guys, you know, they would take uh, the, the Proby shirts and fold them up with their badge and really nice, neat class A shirts and pull them up perfectly and put them in the freezer. So that when they had to respond, they're like, where's my shirt? Oh, it's frozen solid in the freezer. So they would, they would do things like that. So but uh, part, not to say I didn't have rough times as well. Uh, but, um, you know, the ones that tried to push me and that was later, the ones that challenged me, um, you know, I always said, I have a job to do they would try to help me you know i guess the the chivalry of of just maleness you know they would try to help me with things and i would say no i have my job you have your job if i need your help i'll ask you but no well then it sounds i mean you started off as a firefighter and then after a certain period of time you became ambitious in for your trajectory into you know the higher ranks of firefighting I did. And can I you did. talk about what those are, what that journey is, and yes. how challenging that might have been for you? Well, I'm not uh, mechanically inclined, <laughs> and the next uh, the next position is uh, driver engineer or chauffeur. So that means you drive the fire trucks and the ladder trucks and the tanker trucks, and uh, so you start testing for that, and that that test is quite uh, difficult. Uh, but I started, I was going to school. My husband and I were going to school at that time. We were going for our fire officer one, uh, our associate's degree uh, in fire science, as well as that allowed me to start testing. So I started I started uh, taking driver engineer classes. And that's after I became an EMT. And uh, every two years, they would give a driver's test. And I was never number one. I sucked at taking tests. I, I admit it. I say it right now. I, I was terrible. And probably some of it was just, uh, I don't know. I just had a hard time with tests. My husband, on the other hand, um, he inherited his family's brilliance from Berkeley and Stanford and Harvard, you know, so he had that, that educate. He didn't even have to study. He was on the golf course. He, you know, he, he was fine. But um, I ended up taking the driver engineer test, passing it, and if that time, if you weren't number one or two, they would call you an acting driver where they would upgrade you because they'd have shortages, but they weren't promoting anybody. So I upgraded for 12 years. And at the same time, I was a firefighter. I was a fire lieutenant. And I took the lieutenant's training and lieutenant's tests past that. But I was on a list. And I still, if you weren't number one or two, you weren't getting promoted. So between the two positions, I acted as a firefighter on a fire truck or a driver engineer. So I traveled all over Broward County, floated all over Broward County. This is after I passed my probationary tests uh, with the department after a year. And then they start sending you out and then you can start applying to different things. Uh, I yeah. went to school. I was an EMT, as I said. Yeah, and so yeah. I, I drove fire trucks. Man, you'd have to climb under. Hmm. Go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to say, do you need to have an associate fire science degree to become a firefighter? Fighter? It's now? it's actually now what's funny is uh, EMT as well as a uh, fire fire officer. Uh, your associate's degree is now included in your fire training. They've changed it so, so that when you go to the fire academy, you actually not everywhere. You know, everywhere's different. Every state is different, but uh, <clears throat> in Florida. Um, South Florida, particularly, uh, when you go to the fire academy, yes, you come out as an EMT with a uh, an associate's degree in fire science. That's because great. they want you to be a paramedic. They want you to sign up for a paramedic, but you already have that advantage. Whereas everything was separate. 
they even have what they call mesh tests now where, you know, like I told you, I had to go and, and call different departments, get on lists. When are you going to give your test? Now they have a mesh, uh, they call it a mesh system. So um, they finally figured out that why don't all these little departments get together and have these people tested for all these, you know, positions so that we can pick. And so we're not, we're spending the money in, as individual little cities to give these tests. So they've changed, it's changed a lot since, since I started. Are there a lot more, how many more women are in the fire field today? Would you say? Uh, I believe it's nationally 3%, but I know South Florida is very progressive. I know uh, California is very progressive. Um, I've had, I had uh, all full times, not often, but I had all women uh, engine companies and I know Miami did the same. So, and I, women chiefs, um, I was uh, a captain, so I still rode the trucks. And once you get to be a battalion chief, you don't ride the trucks anymore. You're responsible for several stations and the people in them. I was a captain. I was responsible for everybody in a particular station. Wow. Can you, but, uh, you know, I, personally, there is nothing <laughs> that scares me more than fire. I am terrified of fire. Can we talk about what it's like to be a firefighter? What is the worst situation you were in and what was the best or the most unexpected kind of outcome? Well, um, I don't, you know, I, I been in many fires and, you know, your training is what really comes into, into place. You're, you train constantly and, you know, you, you work with people that, you know, you have confidence in them and then, you know, you build your own confidence. And so if you're lucky, you know, you start out you know, there's nothing more adrenaline rush and, and thrilling that when uh, I say on the when I was sitting backwards on a fire truck, then uh, the officer in the front would bang. We had open air cabs then, cabs, engines. You climbed up and you better hook yourself in because you're liable to fall out if you don't. And um, nothing was more thrilling than it was like structure calls you hear it over dispatch and the and the officer would bang 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 on the window as you're getting dressed now you're putting your air pack on and the, you have your boots on but you're putting your coat on putting your air pack on and this is in an open cab well they're screaming code three down the highway and uh when the chief would say or the officer would say bang look look and you turn around and go and all you see is a huge black column of smoke and you know you're headed right for it and it's uh it's thrilling but, um, you know, if you're not scared of fire, you're crazy. Uh, but, you know, you're training. You train uh, signs signs of what stage the fire's in. Uh, you know, you go through all these things. You know, what color is the smoke? How Where's the fire at? How big is it? Um, and so, you know, you learn all those things. And if you're lucky, you know, you go in and you, and you have a, a pot on the stove, we'd say. That's a relatively easy fire and then the next time maybe it got into the cabinets in the kitchen and that's a little more extensive or you might have a bedroom fire at a you know mattress on fire those you gain your confidence but yes it's it's scary because you have zero visibility and you learn how to do right hand wall searches and left hand wall searches and you learn to do everything by feel with your equipment and so you have to learn you know if the fire to ventilate the fire so it doesn't flash um you know there, there's just training constantly and and yes you hope you do make mistakes but hopefully they're not huge ones but it's uh it's not for the weak hearted <laughs> well and tell us a little bit when you when you enter a fire you are in full gear can you tell us how and, and it's heavy can you tell us yes. all the things that you have to put on and yes yes you uh it's called bunker gear uh it's your fire gear and when i first started um you know, I wasn't, well, when I got with the department, I got my own fire gear, but when I was in the academy, I going through training, it just was donated stuff. You just tried on what fit and what, and did your best. But what it is, it's a, uh, uh, it's, it's fire protective gear and it's the classic, you know, your, your pants, uh, and they're lined and they're, they're yellow. You got your red suspenders and you always had, you know, had your boots and your, and your bunker pants folded down with your suspenders folded down and uh we used to put them by our bed and then they discovered that it caused a lot of uh, uh it was health hazards cancers and things so then we kept them out by the in the bay by the truck so you know you jump in your boots and pull your red uh pants up and um and and get your suspenders on and then you have uh you put your nomex hood on which wasn't 
issued when I first, I say in the book how I burnt my ears, a Nomex hood you put over your whole head, protects your everything. You put on your bunker coat and it's all, uh, you know, you're all protected with that. And you have uh, your hands through the, through the holes of that, which is also protective. You have your gloves and then you have, um, you know, if you're going to go on a fire, you have your air, air pack, so you have your mask. And you have that attached to a, a SCBA uh, self-contained breathing apparatus, which they were steel bottles when I got hired. Now they're composite, so they were heavy in themselves. And then you put your gloves on, and uh, you know you go up to a fire with a, a, a nozzle, and the first thing you do is you feel the door. You always stand at the side of the door, and you feel for the door before you open it. You open it slowly, and then you go in, and you know, do what you need to do, depending on the circumstance of, of what type of a fire it is and what type of occupancy it's in and car fires as well. Did you ever, did you ever have a time where you got really scared because you were really at risk in a, in a fire yes. situation? Yes. Tell, about, mm -hmm. tell me about that. Oh, yes. Um, my station was called to respond to a fire in a mansion, basically in a very affluent area of Southwest Florida on the edge of the Everglades called Weston. And it was a huge house and it had been for sale for a while and it caught fire and it was ripping. And we were, our station was probably mm, maybe 10 miles away. I don't know, but you could see the fire and we got called in and it's like, we got called in to fight it and it was huge and it had been just ripping. And this was August. It was so hot anyway. And we got called in and we took a large diameter hose, which was uh, two and a half inches and you had to go up big steps. And when you got in the house, big, huge glass doors. And we were like, oh, my God. You know, and other companies had gone in and tried to fight it. And they needed relief because, again, the temperature, the time of year and all that. And so then we, you go in and had huge steps going down. And I was with, you know, my lieutenant. I was a firefighter at the time. And uh, there were two of us on, a, three of us on the line. And we went in and uh, we're just going down the hall. And we look up and the ceiling starts coming down. And so we turned around and backed out. And the minute we got out the front door, the whole thing collapsed. Wow. <laughs> so it was pretty scary. Yeah. And it was exhaustion. I had heat exhaustion. It was so hot. I was ready. You know, it's like, come on, put me in coach. Give me another air pack. I'll go back in when I can. And my chief was like, no, no, no. That was now rehab, you know, rescue trucks respond as well to rehab the firefighters because, um, you know, uh, a 45 minute bottle is going to last you maybe 30 minutes with your breathing, unless you're really, really, you learn to slow your breathing down and do all that stuff. But you get hot, you know, you get IVs. You know, we had to start IVs on lots of firefighters and transport them, just heat exhaustion. Yeah. Have you ever, have you ever uh, lost a colleague? Yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, actually, um, after I retired, we did. He was on a helicopter and he was somebody that was with another department uh, that merged with ours and uh, just a unbelievably sweet young guy. And uh, he he was in, a, uh, I don't know if you heard about the helicopter crash that was in Broward a few months ago. They were, they were uh, going to respond to transport a patient and uh, the helicopter had a, had a, a malfunction and crashed into an apartment building. Yeah, it was really it was difficult. That was the first in line on on in line duty death that we had had with our department. Lost a lot of people with cancer, lots of people during my time. But as an actual, you know, someone um, you know, in the line of duty, he was the first. And uh, yeah, it's been a, it's you know it's a loss. Um, but you know, you know, we you don't think about those things when you're actually doing the job, or you wouldn't do it. You well, know, I, you. I, you I, it, it particularly intrigues me. You have such a moving section in your book where you talk about 911. For every firefighter in America, 911 was a very big deal. So how is that like the brotherhood? How does something like that unite? Well, you know, um, we respond, uh, we went, our shift was, uh, we were off shift on the 11th and we reported for duty on the 12th. And we were numb. and. Uh, you know, I tell people the 11th, uh, my husband and I had a German shepherd that had cancer and it was on the operating table on September 11th. And so he went to play golf to take his mind off of it. And I went to play go to the gym and that's when the planes hit. Wow. And so, um, yeah, 
And so we responded to our stations, the 12th, and we were just, you know, glued to the TV and numb like everybody else. And we had crews that do uh, their, you know, special ops that got sent up there, worked the pile, a lot of them, you know, and so we worked the overtime. So while they did that, but it was, it was difficult. It was overwhelming. Like I said, I can't imagine what those guys went through because, you know, people were coming into the firehouses constantly which was they meant well you know and they were dropping off food uh, expressing you know their sorrow and and all of that to everywhere it, you know i'm sure it was worldwide in a way but definitely nationwide and you know it was really difficult i mean but that's the job we get hired to do you know you, we say you get paid for what you might have to do and we all knew that if that happens in your town there's a building on fire i mean you know, that's what it is. It's it's putting the fire on, getting the people out, and that's what they did. But it was it was a very strange time. Um, the station I worked at, the the elementary school, had a like a, a honorary uh, kind of a parade for us, and you know, baked goods, and then honored us, and they all brought pictures. You know, drew pictures of us, our heroes. We put up in the station, so. You know, it was very, it was very heartwarming, that part, but it was a difficult time, a little bit overwhelming. Yes, for sure. Well, now we've, we've gone through your career and now you've had some real achievements and you are a captain. Now you are in the driver's seat, so to speak. And I, we would love to know, yes. if, were, were you a decision maker when you were hiring uh, um, people there or how did you handle no. things or how, you know, how do you figure out no. the right mentality to be a firefighter? Well, that's not my job to do that. What yeah. what what the rank structure is is um, I told you I acted as a firefighter and I was I acted as an upgrade driver and an upgrade lieutenant hmm. until we merged. We merged in the early 90s with EMS and you had to become a paramedic in order to climb the rank. Uh, and also there were 28 different fire departments within Broward County's borders and they all wanted to kick us out. And a very uh, one of the sheriff, Broward County Sheriff, he decided that we were going to be the first fire rescue under the umbrella of Broward Sheriff. He wasn't going to lose his fire rescue. We were in all the unincorporated areas, and that's from all the way to Palm Beach County line, to Miami, to the Everglades, to the beach. And so he brought us under his umbrella, and we became Broward Sheriff Fire Rescue, and he saved our jobs. Subsequently, other departments came in with ours. But anyway, at that point, uh, I took a lieutenant's test, and um, they said, you passed both the driver and the lieutenant. We have positions for both. What do you want? And I said, um, I want to be a lieutenant. So I was lieutenant. And then I went to paramedic school 15 years later, which was difficult, became a paramedic. And then uh, I tested for the captain's rank. And the structure of the captain is you run the house. The lieutenant is responsible for the people on a particular piece of fire apparatus, whether it's a rescue truck or a fire truck or a ladder truck. The captain is responsible and first out with whatever piece of, whatever truck he's on or she's on for the station. So I was captain of a station that had two rescues, sometimes with three people each on it, ladder truck with four, which I might be the officer on the ladder truck or an engine with three. So I would be responsible for everything in that station, first on the calls. And um, I wasn't responsible for hiring people. They were on shift and they came to my station. Uh, I did have pe students you know, that were going through paramedic school, they'd come in on the weekends and ride with us. And even firefighters that were volunteers and they were trying to get hired, they would come ride with us. So I did have that experience with, with young, young people. Well, and we always like to, you know, we're getting close to wrapping up our program, but the way that we always like to end up things is giving advice to young girls who might be interested in pursuing a career like yours. Can you give us the lay of the land on, on well, mm -hmm. number one, what kind of character <laughs> and qualities does it take to really be able to thrive and succeed in this role? Uh, probably the same qualities that it takes to, you know, to succeed in a lot of difficult roles, but um, particularly, first of all, you have to have, I say, the heart of a heart of wanting to wanting to help people. That's the basics. You want to you want to help people. Uh, you have to have integrity. You have to have confidence and strength. And if you don't have the confidence, it will come. But don't let them see you sweat, and don't let anyone tell you you can't do it. 
And I always say to young women, you need to draw your line in the sand. You need to make it clear from day one or whatever, whenever something happens that you're not comfortable with, of what you're comfortable with, what your line in the sand is, uh, what is appropriate uh, language. And you know what? I had a thick skin. I heard stuff. There was stuff then that, you know, and I didn't, I wasn't approved, but there were certain things that I would say, listen, you want to talk like that? You go outside. There, you go outside. You're not doing it here. And I make it clear because, you know, sometimes guys wouldn't know and, and, you know, they wouldn't, they didn't know they crossed the line. Next thing you know, they're getting hit with paperwork to go to HR, you know, losing their career. But I do tell women, you know, you have strength and, and, you know, we go in, you know, let people help you and, and get all the training and knowledge that you can be strong, keep yourself physically fit. You're going to school all the time. You, you know, try to try to soak up as much education as you possibly can. Work the busy houses. You know, after a while, you're awarded a bid. You can stay at the slowest station you want to, which some people chose to do. I never did. Go different areas, run different calls, work with different areas, different urban areas. You know, it'll teach you so much. Learn from people that you learn to respect and learn what you don't want to be like from people that you work with that you don't want to be like. But as a woman, especially today, go for it because there's not too many careers where, you know, People come into the firehouse and they thank you for saving their lives. There are people walking around because of the actions that that you that I and my crew took. And there's not a lot of jobs that I think that are as rewarding as that. To make a difference and to have a career where, you know, financially you're going to be great. Um, you know, you're uh, most, you know, urban departments, you have. You have a good retirement, good benefits, things like that. You have, you know, you work a 24 hour schedule, but don't get the job for that. And I tell people that if you got the job for that, you're not going to last. <laughs> get the job because you have passion. You want to help people. You want to, you want to do the right thing by your fellow humans. And as a young woman, don't let anything deter you. Not in today's world. <laughs> well, those are, those are wonderful words of advice. One last question though, would, would, for someone who's, I have a 19 year old niece who is an EMT currently. And I said, well, what are, what are your next, um, you know, thoughts? What are you, where do you want to take this? And she said, sure. well, I'm thinking about joining the air force and working in the fire division. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's so specific. That's so distinct. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering to myself when you're an, a, a teenager, or is it better to be going to the, the uh, associate's degree first or joining a volunteer fire department or volunteering in some capacity? What's the best kind of way to angle into the whole thing? There's two different thoughts, uh, depending on where she's at, but uh, I would recommend go go see if she could volunteer at her local fire department to see if she likes it, but also go to the fire academy in her community and get all the information of what it takes. Because let me tell you what, the fire service, like civil service, is, is in dire need of people. You know, a lot of us old timers, we're, we're gone, we're done. And, and it's such a turnover. And I can tell you what, they're all over the country. They're, they're different cities that are just crying for, you know, new new recruits um it won't be easy if she's able to do it then just uh sign up to the fire academy find out what it takes and in the meantime volunteer because if you have a little bit of a background now as a volunteer it doesn't hurt it's really good to see what it's like it's not like you're walking into something cold and going oh man i uh, i signed up for this i paid the money for this and now it's not what i want to do um and, and and i would advise her to do that before she decides to go the military route which is you know, if she goes the military route and then she gets out of the military and decides she wants to be a firefighter, she'll she'll get points for that. But for me personally, I would say go check out wherever it is she lives because they have fire academies. Find out what the requirements are. Make a make an appointment to 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 look online or go talk or now everything's online. But, you know, go talk to go actually physically go and look at the fire academy. But in the meantime, find out if she has a, a you know, fire department uh closest to where she lives tell her to go in and say you know do you have volunteers or you know how does this work and that will really give her good taste if she's an emt she's already you know halfway that i mean the medical part is part of it 
So I'm sure and she I mean, loves it too. She and she, and she loves it. So, loves it. you know, yeah. you might really open up her, she might really discover her passion, which is the reason I wrote the book. The reason that I'm doing these podcasts, because as you can tell, I've been retired for a while, but I'm, I'm extremely passionate about the fire service, fire rescue service. And I really, really, I mentored young women and I mentored young men as well. And I think it's just, you know, I'm passionate about it, but it's not easy. And it is certainly not for everyone, but as a young woman or a young person, I would say, go do that. Go, go give that a try, you know, do some investigative work. Don't just, you know, don't just, in, unless you're really sure you want to be a firefighter, you know, maybe just go and check it out, see what the Academy requires, look at, see what they're doing, you know, walk around, see if they're all training, you know, you've got recruit classes and then go to the local station and find out if they have volunteers anywhere close by that she could go and she'll learn a lot that way. Mm-hmm. And then find out if it's for her. And I, hopefully it is. Well, she's young. That's a great, that, <laughs> yeah. that's well, great. I started I, I was a little older, but you know, everybody, you know, everybody has a different way of uh, finding their way. And mine was uh, when I was a little bit older, but that's okay. <laughs> well, Cindy, we are, unfortunately, we are running out of time, but I have to say, this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. <laughs> and I'm, 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 so inspired by you. Your book is full of leadership training lessons and information in addition to the firefighting. And I think it's just an absolutely inspiring book for all women, whether you want to pursue fire or not, it's just a great story. But anyway, so we thank you so much for being here. Before we fully say goodbye, we're going to turn things over to our chairwoman, who is Dr. Michelle Krause, and she will have a few final words, and then it'll come back to me, and we'll all say goodbye. But thank you. (laughs) Thank you for having me. What an honor. Thank you. Well, Cindy, you have been a real (laughs) treat. I think you've given our girls a chance to view above, behind the curtain, and to really (laughs) get a feel for what's involved. So thank you so very much. Um, Given that you were in Broward County, my quick question is, how Hmm. much of the senior community were you going off to help and save, or falls, or whatever? Uh, Quite a bit. Oh, yes. Quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's, it's, a you, you know, Florida in general, but Broward County, like any urban area, but particularly mm-hmm. Florida. Oh, yeah. We ran, you know, nursing homes and uh, adult living facilities. And, uh, you know, and we used to go and give talks. We'd, we'd have blood pressure day. On, we'd take all our stuff and go to one of the communities on a Friday or Sunday, okay. and we'd do their blood pressures and just talk to them uh, a lot. We, we, did, we were very involved as you should. And and yes, uh, we ran every kind of call you could think of, you know, fall injuries, whether it be at restaurants or their homes or whatever. And it's a different, and I always say to everyone, listen, you must remember, and I'd say it to a lot of people, I don't care if you find that person laying out in, underneath a park bench, that is somebody's mother, brother, sister, father. You treat them with the utmost respect like they're your own. And that's the creed that I lived by. And that's what I insisted that my crew go by. And, you know, so that's, much. that's just, that's just the way that you, you treat people to take care of them. And of course there's different methods when they're older. Yeah. <laughs> I would, I would, so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I hope the word gets out and some people give you some good feedback. We look forward. Now, Lori's <laughs> looking at me because I have to ask for money. So we only <laughs> are looking for additional shekels, dollars, stock, anything people <laughs> want to give. Or if you work for a large corporation and have a matching grant, just talk to us. If you have additional shares in a lovely tech company, Uh, be generous come help us it funds the work we do and we want to keep doing it it's so important that girls young women see what's possible thank you Thank you, Michelle. And um, girls today have just seen a a living witness to an entire (laughs) firefighting career, which I think is fascinating. So I hope you all have enjoyed this talk. And I hope 
Oh, I wish I could make it focus, but I hope you can <laughs> run right out and get the book, Sister in a Brotherhood, Stories from My Life as a Firefighter, our very first She Heroes book club selection. But Cindy, thank you again so much. It's been absolutely wonderful to talk with you. And on this official note, we will be over and out. And I hope you all have a great night and we'll see you all next time. Mm -hmm.